This is the starting of the Book of Mormon for this year of study and gospel doctrine classes and come follow me. And we this will this presentation will cover the introductory pages of the Book of Mormon and some items of introduction. So with that in mind, let's begin with the introduction to the Book of Mormon. Joseph, the prophet Joseph Smith stated, I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion, and a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. Book of Mormon, <clears throat> I'm sorry, thus the truthfulness of the gospel of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints hinges on the truthfulness and the reality of the Book of Mormon. Therefore, it should not be surprising to anyone that Satan does all he can to try and discredit it through false prophets and teachers. Hence, the Book of Mormon is not only the keystone of our religion, but the keystone of our doctrine and the keystone in the witness of our Lord and Savior. Below, I've given you a little diagram and illustration of what the keystone is. That's the very top stone put in the arch. Without it, notice you'd have to have braces to hold the arch up, but the keystone holds it all together. You take that out, and it all crumbles. If the Book of Mormon is not true, then our whole faith crumbles. And like it said in here, no wonder Satan tries so hard to discredit it, but has never been able to do it, one, because it is true. President Ezra Taft Benson explained the role of the keystone as follows. A keystone is the central stone in an arch. It holds up all the other stones in place, and if removed, the arch crumbles. There are three ways in which the Book of Mormon is the keystone of our religion. It is the keystone in our witness of Christ, it is the keystone of our doctrine, and it is the keystone of our testimony. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency expand on the idea of the Book of Mormon as our doctrinal keystone. Quote, the Book of Mormon is a keystone because it establishes and ties together eternal principles and precepts, rounding out basic doctrines of salvation. It is the growing gem and the diadem of our holy scriptures. It is a keystone for other reasons also. In the promise of Moroni, namely that God will manifest the truth of the Book of Mormon to every sincere inquiry having faith in Christ, we have a key link in a self-locking chain. A confirming testimony of the Book of Mormon convinces that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, and also spiritually verifies the divine calling of Joseph Smith. See, if the Book of Mormon is true, then Joseph Smith has to be a true prophet of God. One follows the other. And that he did see the Father and the Son. With, the, with that firmly in place, it logically follows that one can also receive a verification that the Doctrine, Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price are true companion scriptures to the Bible and the Book of Mormon. So you can see why the Book of Mormon is so essential that you get a witness. Because once you get a witness of that, then all these other aspects have to be true. Joseph Smith is a true prophet. Then the Doctrine, Covenants, and Pearl of, Grace are, or Pearl of Great Price are true scriptures. And then that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that he founded is also true. So that's why you cannot have a true testimony unless you have a witness from the Holy Ghost that the Book of Mormon is truly the Word of God. All of this confirms the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the divine mission of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, led by a living prophet enjoying continuous revelation. From these basic verities and understanding can flow of other saving principles of the fullness of the gospel. The Joel Smith stated, I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth. 
and it was the keystone of our religion. A man, and, and a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. Thus, the truthfulness of the gospel of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints hinges on the truthfulness and reality of the Book of Mormon. Therefore, it should not be surprising to anyone that Satan does all he can to, die to, to discredit it through false priests, prophets, and teachers. Hence, the Book of Mormon is not only the keystone of our religion, but the keystone of our doctrine, the keystone and the witness of our Lord and Jesus Christ. Uh, that is uh, just restated from what I said in the beginning. I'm sorry that uh, I didn't kiss it, but that was doubly stated. But that's because it is doubly true. Elder Jeffrey L. Harland, in a Book of Mormon Symposium that dated August 9, 1994, gave the following response to those who seek to discredit and demean the authenticity of the Book of Mormon, claiming it a book of fiction. Here is his reply to that. A good deal has been said about the authorship and therefore the divine origins of the Book of Mormon lately. But then there has always been a lot said about it ever since it first rolled off the e, old E.B. Grand and Press in downtown Palmyra on the 26th of March, 1830. As a prelude to our own testimony of the divinity of the Book of Mormon, origins, and authorship, let me quote two readily recognizable paragraphs as a central centrality of the book of faith of the book to our faith and its keystone if you will the earlier of the two is from the late bruce r mcconkie and is familiar to all of us Elder mcconkie said in general conference more than 33 years ago the prophet expressed that the book of mormon is the keystone of our religion means precisely what it says the Keystone is the central stone in the top of the arch. If that stone is removed, then the arch crumbles, which in effect means that Mormonism, so-called, which actually is the gospel of Jesus Christ, restored anew in this day, stands or falls with the truth or the falsicity of the Book of Mormon. If the Book of Mormon is true, our message to the world is true. The truth of this message is established in and through this book, end of Elder McConkie's quote. A more recent, more powerful comment to the same effect is from President Ezra Taft Benson, who said, quote, The Book of Mormon is the keystone of our testimony. Just as the arch crumbles if the keystone is removed, so does all the church. Mary, may I repeat that again? All the church stand or fall with the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. The enemies of the church understand this clearly. That is why they go to such great lengths to try to disprove the Book of Mormon. For if they can discredit the prophet Joseph Smith goes with it. So does our claim to the priesthood keys and revelation and the restored church. But in like manner, if the Book of Mormon be true, and millions have now testified that they have a witness of the Spirit that is indeed true, then one must accept the claims of the Restoration and all that accompanies it. Yes, the Book of Mormon is the keystone of our religion, the keystone of our testimony, the keystone of our doctrine, and the keystone in the witness of our Lord and Savior. End of El uh, President Benson's quote. The significance and the implications of those quotes are surely self-evident, not only as powerful freestanding texts, but all the more so as declarations from the lips of the two special witnesses who uttered them. I know of no two men in recent memory who would be less likely to gamble, so to speak, with the gospel of Jesus Christ than would Ezra Taft Benson and Bruce R. McConkie. They are both quite conservative, and conservative people, traditionally speaking, play things, well, conservatively, pretty close to the vest. So, so to hear these two remarkable, able, and gifted, and ordained men say something so tremendously bold, so overwhelming in its implications that everything in the church, everything, rises or falls on the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon, and by implication the Prophet Joseph Smith account of how it came forth, well, to the uninitiated, that can be a little breathtaking. 
It sounds like a sudden death proposition to me. Either the Book of Mormon is what the prophet Joseph Smith said it is, or this church is founder, is, and its founder are false, fraudulent, a deception f from the first instance onward. Not everything in life is so black or white, but it seems the authenticity of the Book of Mormon and its keystone role in our belief is exactly that. Either Joseph Smith was the prophet he said he was, who after seeing the Father and the Son later beheld the angel of Moroni repeatedly heard counsel from his lips eventually receiving at his hands a set of ancient gold plates, which he then translated according to the gift and power of God, or else he did not. And if he did not, in the spirit of President Benson and Elder McClunkey's earlier comments, he is not entitled to retain even the reputation of New England folk hero or well-meaning young man or writer of remarkable fiction. No, he is not entitled to be considered a great teacher or a quintessential American prophet or the creator of a great wisdom literature. If he lied about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, he is certainly none of those. And let's not have any of the embarrassing, silly pap we have heard from some recently about Joseph earnestly thinking he saw an angel, and imagining he translated from a set of golden plates. Excuse me if I am speechless, absolutely, totally, and bewilderingly, incredulously at such a comment. Is that really said with a straight face? If so, I think we have another candidate for the Flat Earth Society. That whole suggestion simply adds insult to infamy. I feel about this as C. E. Lewis once said about the divinity of Christ, a comparison which Dean Robert Millet and others have also made. Lewis once said about the divinity of Christ, quote, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. Christ. That is, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a post egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up as a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let not us come with any part patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Elder, end of quote by Elder, or by C.E.S. Lewis. Back to Pres or Elder Holland. I am suggesting that we make exactly that same kind of do or die bold act assertion about the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the divine origins of the Book of Mormon. We have to. Reason and rightness require it. So quite quickly, President Benson and Elder McConkie's declarations don't seem so bold after all. They are simply logical. Accept Joseph Smith as a prophet and the Book of Mormon as the miraculously revealed and revered word of the Lord it is, or else can consign both man and book to Hades for the de devastating deception of it all. But let's not have any bizarre middle ground about the wonderful contours of a young boy's imagination or his remarkable facility for turning a literary phrase. That is just an inconceivable and finally unacceptable position to take morally, literally, historically, and theologically. As the word of God has always been, 
And I testify again that is purely and simply and precisely what the Book of Mormon is. This record, record is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, to the dividing asunder of both joint and marrow. The Book of Mormon is that quick and it is that powerful for us. And it is certainly is that sharp. Nothing in our history and nothing in our message cuts to the chase faster than our uncompromising declaration that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. On this issue, we draw a line in the sand. A recent critic said that our account of the devotion of the Book of Mormon, and by implication, the Joseph Smith's role in producing it, is the most cherished and unique Mormon's belief. Our collective affirmation here tonight is that we could not agree more heartily, so long as we are allowed to maintain that this is so because the Book of Mormon affirms our yet higher and more sublime belief that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Savior and Redeemer of the world. May I make it very clear where I stand regarding Joseph Smith, a stance taken because of the Book of Mormon. I endorse with all my heart and with the holy office I now hold, indeed with my very life itself, the declaration of John Taylor, who 150 years ago last June took four rounds full bore from the from the prophet Joseph Smith enemies who had surrounded the final stormed Carthage jail. Brother Taylor's life was spared, and he lived to say of Joseph, quote, Joseph Smith and the prophet and seer of the Lord has done more save Jesus only for the salvation of men in this world than any other man that ever lived in it. He lived great, and he died great in the eyes of God, and his people, and like most of the Lord's anointed, has sealed his mission and his works with his own blood. Then, including the beloved Hiram Smith's life as a second witness, Brother Taylor said, The testators are now dead, and their testament is in force. End of quote. Back to Elder Holland, a great many of the judgments concurrently being passed against Joseph Smith are being made far from more comfortable quarters than that second floor of the Carthage jail where John Taylor tried so valiantly to defend his prophet with nothing more than a hickory walking stick. I was not there, but I would offer to be there, then or now or ever, in defense of the truth, the truth of who Joseph Smith said he was and what I know the Book of Mormon to be. As surely as I stand before you tonight, and as you sit in this majestic hall, each of us and this campus in our own way is a product of that miracle which unfolded from Palmyra to Carthage and continues to unfold yet. I testify that Joseph was and is a prophet of God, and that the Book of Mormon is the most correct of any book on earth, the keystone of our religion. I testify to you and to your students, and, and your students will get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. I testify of the certainty of my soul that Joseph Smith entertained an angel and received at his hands an ancient set of gold plates. I testify of that as surely as if I had, with the three witnesses, seen the angel Moroni, or with the three and eight witnesses seen and handled the plates. I testify that the Book of Mormon has changed my life and gave me my initial and still abiding provocation to be an active, involved, committed Latter-day Saint. Much more has happened since those first missionary years, elements of my testimony which I cannot now deny any now any more than I could deny the Book of Mormon. But in the first instance, it was the Book of Mormon that changed my life, told me the gospel of Jesus Christ has been restored, and immersed me in the church, heart and soul. I hold it in a category sacred to me among all the world's literature. I have read a fair number of book in my, books in my day, and I hope to read a few more. I am not a scholar, but once thought I might be. 
I had the beginnings of reasonable good training at some pretty good schools. Just to let you know, he earned his doctorate at Yale University. Back to Elder Holland. All of that has changed now, but I believe I still have something of an eye for a penetrating line of prose, and I know and can recognize profundity, profundity in print, especially when I see it page after page after page. I say again, the Book of Mormon stands preeminent in my intellect and spiritual life. The classic of all classics, a reaffirmation of the Holy Bible, a voice from the dust, a witness for the Christ and the word of the Lord unto salvation. The fact that others openly oppose such conviction is, of course, not new. It is as if M Mrs. Martin Harris has once again mounted her horse and is riding from house to house throughout the neighborhood like a dark spirit making diligent inquiry wherever she had the least hopes of gleaning anything and stirring up every malicious feeling which would tend to sub subverse her wicked purpose. As Professor Dan Peterson said recently of such contemporary efforts, plus ka change plus kasila min chos, that must be Latin, editor's introduction, meaning the more things change, the more they stay the same. And by the way, speaking of Mrs. Harris, if the loss of those 116 pages shared with her were simply the disappearance of some thoughtful wisdom literature and a few chapters of remarkable defiction, de as opponents of the Book of Mormon would say, what's the big deal? Why then all the busyness about Joseph going to the depths of hell, worrying about whether he was going to get the manuscript back, and fearing the rebuke of God? He's a quick study. He's a frontier talent. He can just write some more. Listen to some of the emotion of that moment. When Martin Harris does not return and does not return, does not return and does not return and does not return with the manuscript, Although Joseph was now nearly worn out, sleep fled from his eyes, neither had any, he had any desire for food, for he felt that he had done wrong, and how great his condemnation was, he did not know. When a fellow traveler inquired about Joseph's gloomy appearance and the cause of his affliction, Joseph thanked him for his kindness and mentioned that he had been caring for a sick wife and a child, and that the child had died. As a result, his wife was very despondent, but he refrained from giving any further explanation beyond that. When pressed about the situation, Joseph replied as before, that he had left his wife in such precarious health that he feared he should not find her alive when he returned. Furthermore, he had buried his first and only child just days ago. But note this, there was another trouble laying at his heart, which he dare not mention. Another trouble, deeper than those, deeper than a wife who was on the threshold of dying and a son who already passed? How deep can such a trouble be? And how could possibly, what could possibly be the nature of it? Well, you and I know the answer to that. The next morning, 8 o'clock came and went, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock came and went. Finally, at half past 12, Martin is seen walking with a slow and measured step towards the Smith house, his eyes fixed remorsefully on the ground. Then he paused at the gate, drawing his hat down over his eyes. Finally, summon, summoning the courage to enter the house, he takes up his knife and fork to eat a pro founded noon mill with the Smith family, but immediately drops his utensils. Hiram Smith, observing that, says, Martin, are you sick? Upon which Martin Harris pressed his hands to his head and cried out in a tone of deep anguish, Oh, I have lost my soul. I have lost my soul. Joseph, who had not verbalized his fears until then, springs from the table crying, Martin, have you lost that manuscript? Have you broken your oath and brought down condemnation upon my head as well as your own? 
Yes, it is gone, replied Martin, and I know not where. Oh, my God, says Joseph, clutching his hands. All is lost. All is lost. What shall I do? I have sinned. It is I who tempted the wrath of God. I should have been satisfied with the first answer which I received from the Lord, for he told me that it was not safe to let the writings go out of my possession. He then wept and groaned and walked the floor in anguish. At length, he tells Martin to go back and search again. No, says Martin, it is all in vain, for I have ripped open every bed, pillows, and I know not, and I know it is not there. Then I, then must I, says Joseph, return with such a tale as this? I dare not do it. How shall I appear before the Lord? Of what rebuke am I not worthy from the angel of the Most High? The prophet's mother then adds this final commentary. I besought him not to mourn so, for perhaps the Lord would forgive him after a short season of humiliation and repentance. But what could I do to confront him when he saw all the family in the same situation of mind as himself? For sobs and groans and the most bitter lamentations filled the house. However, Joseph was more distressed than the rest, as he better understood the consequences of disobedience, and he continued pacing back and forth, meantime weeping and grieving, until about sunset, then by persuasion he took a little nourishment. The next morning he set out for home. He parted with heavy hearts, for it was now appeared that all which we had fondly anticipated, and which had been the source of so much secret gratification, had in a moment fled and fled forever. Well, my goodness, that's an elaborate little side story, which makes absolutely no sense at all, unless, of course, there really were plates, and there really was a translation process going on, and there really had been a solemn covenant made with the Lord, and there really was an enemy who did not want that book to come forth in this generation. Talk about literary flair and a gift for fiction. Lucy Max Smith gets an A, right along with her son. If this is all an imaginary venture, to say nothing of the terrific performance by Mr. and Mrs. Harris and the entire first generation of the church. Which is only to say what so many have said before, that if Joseph Smith or anyone else, or for that matter, created the Book of Mormon, out of whole cloth, that to me is a far greater miracle than the proposition that he translated it from an ancient record by an endowment of divine power. Has anyone in this audience ever tried to write anything? Have you ever, with your degrees and libraries and computers and research assistants, ever tried to write anything that anyone could stand to read? If you have, my guess is you haven't succeeded at writing anything anyone would want to read more than once, or to say it changed their lives, or to say they were willing to leave family and fortune and future for it and then do so. Your, you thought it was tough to have your dissertation committee grill you for a couple of hours. Try tossing your piece of work to the most hostile and learned of, of enemies say, for, say, 164 years, just to pull a number out of the air. Go ahead, put that terrific master's thesis of yours out there under a microscope for everyone to kick and gorge and attack for a century or two. And let's see how marvelous you think your university-produced accomplishment is then. After a little of that, are you still standing by the divinity and immortality of your work? Is anybody still reading it? 
In light of all this, as, as it applies to the Book of Mormon, which is still changing human lives and still moving moral, mount, moral mountains, and as one who has tried to write a line or two of both poetry and prose and have failed miserably, I want to meet the author of this work, whoever it is. I want to praise firsthand such a remarkable, gifted writer. Furthermore, I'd love to read anything, I'd read anything else this elusive figure has ever written. I'd love to talk to the whole research team who must have produced it. If they've got anything else they've ever put their pen to, I'll pay any amount of money to get a hold of it. This is written <clears throat> that this writing that moves millions so obviously it could make millions let's talk contracts surely surely in 164 years there must be someone willing to step forward you know the real author to claim credit for such a remarkable document and all that has transpired in its wake or at least the descendants of such an author should have come forth by now willing to cash to, to cashier the whole thing. Where are they? Well, the simple fact of the matter is no other origin of the Book of Mormon has ever come to light, nor will it, because there is no other. A bad man could not have fabricated such an inspiring book, and a good man would not have done so. The real author died nearly two millennia ago. Joseph Smith... He is what he says he was, a seer and a revelator, an instrument in the hands of the Almighty, translating, but not authoring, that which the Lord said would hiss forth from the ends of the earth, a standard unto his people. I testify that the Book of Mormon is true, and that the revealed word of the Lord and the Latter-day Standard for His covenant people, it cannot and will not be disproven, because it is true. The testators have been dead for a hundred and fifty years, but their testament is still in force. Man, can you imagine, brothers and sisters, just like either Jesus is the Christ or the devil himself, there is no in-between. He's not just a good rabbi. So Joseph Smith is either a prophet of God who produced the Book of Mormon or he is the devil himself that has produced something to deceive everyone. There is no middle ground. I leave my witness. He is truly a prophet. I have heard personally, the voice of Christ testify to my mind and soul that very thing. With the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, only those who are deceived by the great deceiver himself deny the miraculous work and wonder of this great book of Scripture. As Nephi states, if only true, if only truly believers in Christ, then they will also believe in the Book of Mormon. And now, my beloved brethren, and also Jew, and all ye ends of the earth, hearken unto these words, and believe in Christ. And if you believe not in these words, believe in Christ. And if you believe in Christ, you will believe these words, for they are the words of Christ. And he hath given them unto me, and they teach all men that they shall do good. That's how you can know if someone truly as a witness of the divinity of Christ, that once they read the Book of Mormon, they believe it is a testimony of Jesus Christ. Those who claim to be Christians and have read it and discredit the Book of Mormon are not true Christians. Book of Mormon title page and its importance. The Book of Mormon title page begins... The Book of Mormon, an account written by the hand of Mormon upon plates taken from the plates of Nephi. This is followed by two paragraphs believed to be authored by the Book of Mormon prophet Moroni, son of Mormon. 
The prophet Joseph Smith explained that the title page of the Book of Mormon is a literal translation taken from the very last leaf on the left-hand side of the collection or book of plates, which contain the records which has been translated, the language of the whole running the same as all Hebrew writing in general, that is, from right to left. And that said title page is not by any means a modern composition, either of mine or of any other man who has lived or does live in this generation. The first paragraph of the Book of Mormon's title page declares that the sacred record will come forth in due time. President Ezra Taft Benson testified that the coming Timing of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon shows its significance in the restoration of the gospel. Quote, a powerful testimony to the importance of the Book of Mormon is to note where the Lord placed its coming forth in the timetable of the unfolding restoration. The only thing that preceded it was the first vision. In that marvelous manifestation, the prophet Joseph Smith learned the true nature of God and that God had a work for him to do. The coming forth of the Book of Mormon was the next thing that follow, to follow. Thinking of that in terms of what it implies, the coming forth of the Book of Mormon preceded the restoration of the priesthood. It was published just a few days before the church was organized. The saints were given the Book of Mormon to read before they were given the revelations outlining such great doctrines as the three degrees of glory, celestial marriage, or work for the dead. It came before priesthood quorums and, and church organization. Doesn't this tell us something about how the Lord views this sacred work? End of President Benson's quote. Elder L. Tom Perry of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained that the Book of Mormon was written for our day, quote, The major writers of the Book of Mormon fully understood that their writings were primarily for the people of a future generation, rather, for the pe rather than for the people of their own generation. Moroni wrote to our generation, I speak unto you as if ye were present. End of President Elder Perry's quote. Speaking of our need to apply the Book of Mormon in our times, President Ezra Taft Benson declared, quote, If they saw our day and chose those things which would be of greatest worth unto us, is, it, is not that how we should study the Book of Mormon? We should constantly ask ourselves, why did the Lord inspire Mormon or Moroni or Almai to include that in this record? What lesson can I learn from that to help me live in this day and age? End of President Benson's quote. Elder Bruce R. McConkie writes, One of the most solemn oaths ever given to man is found in these words of the Lord relative to Joseph Smith in the Book of Mormon. He, meaning Joseph Smith, has translated the book. Even that part which I have commanded him, saith the Lord, and as your Lord and your God liveth, it is true. That's from Doctrine and Covenants, section 17.6. So the Savior himself bears his own testimony of the truth of the Book of Mormon. This is God's testimony of the Book of Mormon. In it, deity has laid his godhood on the line. Either the book is true or he ceases to be God. There neither is nor can be any more formal or powerful language known to men or gods. End of Brother McConkie's quote. We can hardly overstate the importance of this voice of truth out of the earth, these glad tidings from Camorra. Take away the Book of Mormon, said Joseph Smith, and the revelations, and where is our religion? We have none. According to the title page, the purpose of the Book of Mormon is to bring Jew and Gentile to the conviction that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, manifesting himself unto all nations. Concerning the Book of Mormon's role in the gathering of Israel, that of bringing Jew and Gentile to the conviction that Jesus is the Christ, in the last days, Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles wrote, quote, as far as the gathering of Israel is concerned, the Book of Mormon is the most important book that ever has been or ever will be written. 
It is the book that gathers Israel and that reveals in plainness and perfection the doctrine of the gathering of the chosen seed. It is the book given of God to prove the truth and divinity of this great latter-day work. It contains the fullness of the everlasting gospel and carries with it the evidence of its own divinity. Every person who is truly converted knows by the revelations of the Holy Ghost to the Spirit within him that the Book of Mormon is the mind and will and voice of the Lord to the world today. It is the Book of Mormon that causes people to believe the gospel and join the church. And as we have heard the fortune Hitherto foreseen, it is the power that brings to pass the gathering of Israel. If therefore were if there were no Book of Mormon from a practical standpoint, the gathering of the Lord's people in the latter days would come to a standstill. The lost sheep of Israel hear the voice of their shepherd as it is found in that book, and heeding that voice come into the true sheepfold. There is no other way of overstating the importance of this book of Nephi scripture in the salvation of men in the latter days. End of Ella McConkie's quote. The title page states that the Book of Mormon was written by way of commandment and also by the spirit of prophecy and of revelation, written and sealed up and hid up unto the Lord, that they might not be destroyed to come forth by the gift and power of God into the interpretation thereof. Elder Russell M. Nelson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles shares some remarkable information about the Book of Mormon being translated by the gift and power of God. Quoting Elder Nelson, The details of this miraculous method of translation are still not fully known, yet we do have a few precious insights. Emma Smith, who acted as an early scribe for Joseph, gave this account in 1856. She quotes, When my husband was translating the Book of Mormon, I wrote part of it as he dictated each sentence, word for word, and when he came to proper names, he could not pronounce or long words, he spelled them out, and while I was writing them, if I made any mistake in spelling, he would stop me and correct my spelling, although it was impossible for him to see how I was writing them down at the time. Even the word Sarah he could not pronounce at first, but had to spell it, and I would pronounce it for him. When he stopped for any purpose at any time, he would then commence again where he left off without any hesitation. And one time while he was translating, he stopped suddenly, pale as a sheet, and said, Emma, did Jerusalem have walls around it? When I answered yes, he replied, oh, I didn't know. I was afraid I had been deceived. He had such a limited knowledge of history at the time that he did not even know that Jerusalem was surrounded by walls. End of Emma Smith's quote. Going back to President Nelson, although the prophet would polish his skills over the years, Emma acknowledged that Joseph possessed only rudimentary literary, liter, literacy at the time he translated the gold plates. Quoting, Joseph Smith could neither write nor dictate a coherent and well-worded letter, let alone translate a book like the Book of Mormon. And though I was an active participant in the scenes that transpired, it is marvelous to me, a marvel and a wonder, as much as to anyone else. That's end of a quote by Emma Smith. The Book of Mormon, subtitled Another Testament of Jesus Christ, emphasizes its paramount purpose. President Boyd K. Packer, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained the significance of the subtitle. By recent decision of the Brethren, the Book of Mormon will henceforth bear the title, The Book of Mormon, with the subtitle, Another Testament of Jesus Christ. The stick or record of Judah, the Old Testament and the New Testament, and the stick or record of Ephraim, the Book of Mormon, which is another testament of Jesus Christ, are now woven together in such a way that as you pour over one, you are drawn to the other. As you learn from one, you are enlightened by the other. 
They are indeed one in our hands. Ezekiel's prophecy now stands fulfilled. End of President Packer's quote. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland gave further explanation, quote, The Lord has offered us one last covenant, given us one last testament as part of his final outreach to follow man. He has offered us one last wit written witness of his love and his mercy extended for the final time. That testimony and culminating witness, that new covenant offered to the children of men, but once more, is the message of the Book of Mormon. No record teaches more of God's promise to those in the last days. Those promises focus on his only begotten Son, on the merits and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah, who shall make intercession for all the children of men, and they that believe in him shall be saved. The task of the children of God in these concluding days of the world's history is to proceed with unshaken faith in him, relying wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save, to press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men, feasting upon the word of Christ and enduring to the end. This is the way, and there is none other way nor name given under heaven whereby man can be saved in the kingdom of God. No other book helps us do this so well. No other book was ever divinely produced and protected slow, solely for that purpose. No other book has ever been written with such a fuel a fuel of a full view of the future dispensation to which that record would eventually come. In its message of faith in Christ, hope in Christ, and charity in Christ, the Book of Mormon is God's new covenant to his children for the last time. Eld, end of Elder Holland's quote. Elder Russell M. Nelson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles counted, quote, when you read the Book of Mormon, Concentrate on the principal figure in the Book of Mormon, from its first chapter to the last, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Living God. End of quote. President Ezra Taft Benson taught that the Book of Mormon helps us to discern truth from error. Quote, we should know the Book of Mormon better than any other book. Not only should we know what history and faith-promoting stories it contains, but we should understand its teachings. If we really do our homework and approach the Book of Mormon doctrinally, we can expose the errors and find the truths to combat many of the current false theories and philosophies of men. I have noted within the church a, discern a difference in discernment, insight, conviction, and spirit between those who know and love the Book of Mormon and those who do not. That book is a great sifter. End of quote. The pen of man knows no more perfect witness of God and Christ, of the atonement of the manner by which sins are remitted, or of the doctrine that leads us back to the divine presence than the Book of Mormon. So that spirit testifies. Brothers and sisters, may we come to know this book better. May we focus more on Christ. May Christ come more into our hearts and into our very souls. Let's get rid of this false notion that the Book of Mormon teaches great doctrinal principles, but is not historically correct, that it didn't historically really happen. What a stupid and false notion that is preached amongst some in this truth. If those events never really happened, then what good are the principles and its doctrines? Then that means Jesus Christ never really did atone for our sins and that we could never really repent. May we come to know of its truthfulness, not just of its doctrinal principles, but of its historicity, that Alma, Nephi, Helaman, Moroni, Mormon, Captain Moroni, all of them are real men who lived 
and died and wrote this book so that we could come unto Christ, and may we do so. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button.